Just like every human, every horse has a story. There is a unique bond with all the history behind humans and horses, an unspoken connection between the two species. We will take a closer look into the day-to-day of two Arizona horse farms. The women who run the day-to-day operations of each farm have dedicated their life's work to helping horses and humans live better lives. Each has a very different purpose, one preservation, another therapy. Two remarkable Arizona farms, two incredible women, two amazing stories about horse heroes. On an acre lot in Gilbert, Arizona, live four Clydesdales, or gentle giants as they like to call them. There are less than 5,000 Clydesdales left in the entire world. The Clydesdale population is classified as threatened. Extinction is forever. Threatened means there's still time. The Clydesdale Preservation Foundation began in 2012 by a woman named Rebecca Stivers. There are several volunteers who help out every day during the morning and the night shift. As a foundation, the most significant responsibility is to ensure that the Clydesdale breed's relevance in society never fades away. There are four Clydesdales Their names are Lakota, Onita, Sakari, and Hawkeye. Three females and one male. The Clydesdale is a Scottish breed of a draft horse. They can weigh as much as 2,000 pounds. Clydesdales are typically bay-colored horses. However, the Clydesdale Preservation Foundation has a male named Hawkeye with a unique black coat. Clydesdales gave a lot to our ancestors and our nation. They have played a considerable role in our past, and we have the pleasure of experiencing them in our present. I'm speeding up, so. yeah. Yeah. That's serious. We began USA Clydesdale Preservation Foundation in 2012. We did this because we wanted to help the Clydesdales. We had a lot of experience here of working with the Clydesdales, got to know them really well, And so we started the foundation, and our purpose is to educate the public about the Clydesdales' past and their present. Also, we do a lot of demonstrations under saddle because we believe giving back into a at-risk breed is very important at giving them a purpose. So we began putting them under saddle and riding them to help them have another purpose that people could see frequently. We don't usually lack having volunteers here. It's very simple, they apply on our website and they come here for an orientation and then they can start. And we set dates for them that they can come in and and they start their journey. We have people coming from corporate America, we have retirees, we have women that are moms and that they have given up their horse world to raise a family and now they come back and they help us with the Clydesdales. We have women that come from Canada during the winters and come here and spend every winter with us and help us take care of the Clydesdales. We have about 500 students that come here to help us with the Clydesdales, to learn about the Clydesdales And they come and they volunteer, and they are amazing. All of these students come from our colleges, our our, our universities, our high schools. We even have some tech schools that are here that teach the students to be um, vet techs or pre-vet programs. So we have a huge amount of volunteers that enjoy their time here. Our volunteers work very hard here. We have a lot of work for them to do when they come on staff here to take care of the Clydesdales. A lot of grooming, we we groom every day, we clean hooves every day. 
they're fed five meals a day here for the Clydesdales. And we do a lot of exercising, we do baths. It's a busy place when we get our volunteers here. The, the work is hard work, it's very hands-on. Um, we, we bathe the Clydes, we feed the Clydes, we, we do every aspect of animal care. Um, depending on what your skill level is. Like when I came here, I was a complete novice. Um, I've always loved horses, but I haven't been around horses. So over the past three years, I feel like I've, I've learned so much about horsemanship in general. And then specifically the, the, the special care that these babies need on a daily basis. It's, it's a lot, but it's, at the end of the shift, you go home and you just know you made a difference. You made a difference in their lives, and it's all worth it. For me, it's kind of hard to talk about the herd in general, because the herd is made up by each individual horse, and they, they just bring something different to the herd to make them that one whole group. But like Onita, she's, just, she's kind of like the little mama. She's... Um, She's the peacemaker, and she just wants everything to go well, you know? So, they each, they each bring something different, and that's what I love. Hi, this is Lakota. She's one of the Clydesdales at USACPF. She is 25. Oh no, she'll be 25 in March of this next year. She came from a, a breeder in Batavia, Iowa, and her name was Tracy Miller, and she has MTM Clydesdales. She's a very good, solid horse over the last 24 years. And she is a little bit traditional breeding, and um, she is wonderful. She has... Um, worked the entire time that she has been here. She started off by working in equine therapy for several years. And in fact, it was 14 years. And she worked with kids from the East Valley that had behavioral disorders and did a wonderful job. At 14 years, I retired. And then she got another job. She began working on the USA Clydesdale drill team, and she was such a good, a good member of the drill team. She led them in many um, parades and um, other activities. And we did that for a few years, and then we decided that we were going to help with the USA Clydesdale Preservation Foundation. And that's when she decided she was going to be the herd boss of the herd. And that's what her current role is now. She takes care of the rest of the herd and lets them know when they're needing some direction. And um, she, she's just an amazing horse. Very kind, very sweet. And I have enjoyed her. She's been at my side forever. We have a little sad news. Um, a couple days ago, one of, her, one of the mares from her bloodline um, had passed away, and it's, it was very sad for the family and very sad for um, the people that knew that horse because she was an amazing, strong horse and a wonderful broodmare. We, we, we strongly feel that um, it's very difficult for those of us that think about preservation that, you know, when you lose a mare that has, you know, given so much, and could continue to give. It's a really missed animal in in the Clydesdale world. She's very good with children, and I'm so proud of her when she does that. It is an awful good feeling when you have a horse that is just amazing and knows what to do with a young one, and she'll just stand there and hang her head for them. And it just makes me so happy that she can do stuff like that. We're quite friends. We are very, very connected. I see her every day, and when I don't, it's, it's, not, a, it's not a great day for me. We're, we're pretty attached. She likes to eat, without doubt. <laughs> she's, she's the one that eats first, because she's the herd boss, and that's what they do. 
and uh, and she although she takes care of the herds at night I can look out here and the rest of the herd will be laying down and she'll be standing up around them just kind of doing something that's primitive you know staying staying out there and watching over the herd they get a bath every week um, if we're not participating in um, our bath days for the Clydesdales, which allows family members in um, the city or in the valley to come out and help give baths to the Clydesdales and learn all about them. We're going to check in with Corey here in a few minutes. He uh, has the great job of washing Clydesdales today. Yeah. I mean, somebody's got to do it. Well, so he we said figured, it. why not him? They have a really strong, like, hose you know, to like find the nooks and crannies. Rebecca Ew. though, she's a dang expert on Clydesdale. Rebecca <laughs> Stivers, uh, and uh, I love your shirt there. Tell us what the USA CPF is. USA Clydesdale Preservation Foundation. We are an educational um, preservation foundation dedicated to the Clydesdale breed. Now, everyone is in love with the Clydesdales. Of course, uh, the Anheuser-Busch Corporation gives them probably their biggest uh, platform, uh, but they, they're a beloved breed. They seem so gentle and friendly. Is that because of what we're seeing on, on the screen, or is that really their uh, personality? These, that is their personality. They are, their nickname is the Gentle Giants. Mm -hmm. and, um, and it's for a reason. They are have a very good temperament, um, easy to work with, um, love, love people. It's just amazing. Yeah. So, and so, we were fortunate because three of our horses worked as equine therapy horses before we even started the program. Oh, I bet it feels so good. I know. Do you see their eyes? Like when they were, when the, you know, the feeling like when you get a good rub, like a back yeah. rub. Yeah. They're just like, oh, they're, they're like so everybody good. else. Yeah, they are. What I enjoy the most um, being the director right of the, the foundation so they can see is that. being able to I be creative. We started out very focused on just our education yes. of teaching, yes. which is good, but now we have implemented it into many different areas. Um, yeah, for a while, but she may Dr. Carrie Brandt Off is a professor of sociology and gender and sexuality studies at Fort Lewis College. She studied human animal connections and the relationship between humans and horses and how the two have communicated and bonded. I met a horse when I was seven and I don't remember them not being in my life from that point on. Um, and so I grew up riding horses, sort of eat, breathe, sleep horses, you know, throughout my adolescence. And then I took a little time away in college. And then when I went to graduate school, I was riding a lot again. And there was this new field emerging in sociology called human animal studies. And I was at CU Boulder and it just happened to be that one of the leading people in human animal studies at the time, Leslie Irvin was also at CU Boulder. And so I started working with Leslie and she would encourage me to, to think about doing a dissertation with horses. And I kept thinking, that's just not possible. Like your dissertation is supposed to be some, you know, I don't know, really arduous, like it didn't seem like a, like, like a, you could have fun or something, you know, have a fun topic doing your dissertation. So I, I tried other topics, but then she kind of convinced me to really start taking a sociological lens to thinking about humans and horses. And most people were writing about dogs and cats at that point. And so I did start to think about, you know, what, what was making it possible for humans and horses to do what they do together? And how was it that you could have, you know, this small, relatively small human in comparison to the horse? How could you sort of bring these two species together and unite in some kind of shared activity, you know, and of course, acknowledging that that shared activity is a human centered goal. It's not probably a goal that the horse intends, but that horses sort of join us in the adventures we ask of them. I started to see that it was quite remarkable. And so I wanted to make sense of what made that possible. And of course, you know, like any shared activity between humans, 
you need to have a way to create meaning around that shared activity in order to have it sort of work in a coherent way. And so one of the primary ways in which we create meaning among humans is through language. And our language is primarily verbal. Of course, there's embodied language. But I started to think, so there must be some kind of language between humans and horses that make this possible because I was also in the world of hunter jumpers. And so I was watching people, you know, jump a full course of, you know, eight to 12 jumps at, you know, five feet high, you know, in this rhythmic sequence. And I was like, how does, how is that possible? And so I started to see that there was a language. And so I started to interview people. And I interviewed women only for this research project. And it it was not because I didn't value men's perspectives or men's wisdom about horses, but I felt that men's stories around horses tend to dominate the airwaves. You know, we hear a lot. I mean, when we hear about women and horses, we tend to hear about girls who fall in love with horses and they're more sentimental. But, you know, the when we hear about sort of the the professionals and the trainers and the ones who are knowledgeable, those tend to generally be men. And so I knew all these amazing women. And so I started to interview them and they all started to talk about this language and that they shared with horses. And then I was trying to articulate what that language was and it's not quite human and it's not quite horse. It was something sort of this third kind of language that developed between humans and horses. So it became this, this medium through their, their bodies became this medium through which they could communicate to each other. And humans really have to learn sort of that to, to tune into that sensitivity of their bodies and their emotions as a form of communication with horses. And I think horses learn to communicate with humans. I don't think they purely communicate with us the way they would with other horses. I think they're doing something different with us. And so that's really sort of where my interest began. And then where I just dove in deep in terms of my dissertation. And then from then on, you know, I've continued to research and write about how humans and horses kind of create a world of shared meaning together. I grew up in Boulder, Colorado, and I also went back to graduate school in Boulder. So I was back in my sort of home horse communities. And, but one of the things that really drove me to focus on women is I began this research in like 2000, say. And at that time, what now is sort of called natural horsemanship was really starting to boom and come on the scene. And it was becoming really popular, really fast. And right in front of my eyes, I was sort of watching this multi-million dollar industry emerge around human horse communication. And what was so interesting was that it had all these men at the center of it. And they're primarily sort of cowboy-like men, primarily Anglo men. And, And I was like, well, that's interesting. I mean, not that these, a lot of these men weren't really talented, but I was like, where are the women? So I started going to all these natural horsemanship clinics, you know, and from people that are really sort of household names now. And I, I was learning wonderful things from them, but a lot of what I, uh, they were teaching were things I had learned from horsewomen my whole life. So I, I started to think like, why is their knowledge absent in this booming industry? And then interestingly, I would go to natural horsemanship clinics that were taught by women and, you know, there'd barely be anyone there and they were clearly really talented women. And so, you know, I mean, it's just like anything, of course, there were people who weren't as talented too, but I started to get really curious of why men's sort of knowledge and stories were at the center of the way in which we made sense of human horse communication. And so that's what sort of led me to zero in on women not because men don't, you know, men certainly have great knowledge about horses and women don't have any sort of special knowledge that men don't, but their knowledge and their stories are often not at the center.
Founded in 1980 in North Scottsdale on a little over 14 acres is a horse property known as Camelot. Founder Eileen Sachowski is a horsewoman with a degenerative neuromuscular disease. Eileen spent years studying and learning from Joseph Rivers, a polio survivor. Camelot is a bridge leading to a life of freedom and self-fulfillment for children and adults with a physical disability. The mission is to improve the quality of life for children and adults with disabilities through programs of horsemanship and outdoor education that develop self-worth, independence, and active participation in the community. Camelot is much more than a writing program. It is a state-of-the-art nonprofit that offers horsemanship as a means of therapy to improve strength, balance, coordination, and self-esteem. Camelot is a philosophy that views every human being as a masterpiece and rests on the belief that love and courage can slay the mightiest of dragons. Five horses serve as therapy horses at the facility, and their names are Ashley, Barbara, Cliffy, Frisco, and Jim. All are different shapes and sizes to accommodate children and adults of all ages and body types. Camelot's fully equipped with an indoor arena, wagons, lifts, and lots of supplies and tools you wouldn't usually find in a horse barn to keep the program thriving. There are also many volunteers to lend a helping hand around the ranch. course, we can't forget about the coop full of chickens. Camelot, and this is an organization that is predominantly volunteer supported. We have a team of about 40 volunteers. It ranges from 40 to 50 throughout the typical year. And our volunteers come in the morning and they help prepare the facility for our lesson services, which are in the afternoon. No, you're not is there any left? I can think so. These are them. It's not always fun work, but it is rewarding. And in the end, the volunteers have a significant impact on both the students and the horses. At Camelot, bonds created between horses and humans are indescribable and unbreakable. And around one o'clock, our afternoon volunteers come and they are gonna be working alongside the instructors providing the writing lesson services. Acquiring the horses for our program is not an easy task. It's one that requires a lot of time and, and careful thought. Our horses that come in, they need to be very willing workers. They need to be quiet in hand. They need to have the disposition that will allow them to tolerate students that use a lot of different mobility um, aids, possible communication devices and such. So. They need to be horses that can kind of think outside of the box and be quiet with a lot of equipment that you wouldn't see in your mainstream barn. But more than anything, they just have to be 
patient and quiet. And it doesn't mean, you know, under saddle, I want them quiet. I don't want them overreactive to environmental stimulus, such as dust devils going by or maybe birds flying through our arena. Yeah, you go up the ramp. This is perfume. The volunteers at Camelot all go through a certification program. They must be knowledgeable and take the proper precautions when working with the students and the horses. And you're ready, you're going to say, whoa, Barbara, and you're going to touch your saddle, swing your right leg over, and start jumping into the saddle. Okay, all right, go ahead. Whoa, Barbara. Well, swing that right leg really high. Slide on over so that you're in the center. Okay, comfortable? Okay. Okay. Slide. These are a little bit short. I'm going to come down and maybe I have short arms. You know what's funny? I do have long legs for my body. Well, no. <laughs> I shortened that side. Oh, you side, did? Because um, I was longer on that side, so they were just like, yeah. I got to fight them with their bump in. Yeah. Okay, this one in from this. Go ahead. Give me a second. I'll go to the other side. Actually, we're going to do two-handed. Actually, we're going to do two-handed. When you're ready, you're going to ask her to walk on, and we're going to go into the arena. Walk on, Barbara. Walk on. Do the anticipating I did over here. She's like, I know what to do. Stop for your voice lines in. Go ahead and ask her to blow. And I will check that bird that cinch because you're not in an English saddle. I actually didn't start Camelot. Um, our founder, Eileen Chahusky, started Camelot. She founded the program in 1980 and had all of the government paperwork finalized and was operating as a 501c3 in 1983. I came through the gates of Camelot in 2002. I became involved with Camelot. Initially, I came out to talk to the founder I had recently moved to Scottsdale and I had interest to start my own writing program. I've been teaching at a program called the National Ability Center in Park City, Utah. And when I moved here, I knew that I wanted to teach lessons. I wanted to provide services to writers with physical disabilities. I wanted to provide classes that were long enough that gave students the opportunity to learn mastery of skill sets on their own and I wanted a small kind of a niche program. So what I didn't know was how to start a program. So I came out and I met with Eileen to talk to her about how does one start a, a 501c3. What I didn't expect was to come through the gate and never leave. <laughs> what I found when I came through the gate was exactly what I was looking to do. And unbeknownst to me, Eileen had begun her plan of succession. She was looking to retire in a few years and could say it was fate, you could say it was perfect timing, but for me it was absolutely perfect. I'm certified through PATH International. They are the, the company that kind of has created the safety standards for this industry and I'm also a certified riding instructor through PATH. They just this past year have kind of changed their certification um, program and I'm an advanced instructor through CHA. My reason for getting up every day is to interact with my students here at Camelot. We run a school of dragon slayers. It is our firm belief and it was our founder's belief that everyone has within them that fear of failing, that voice inside that says I can't. And at Camelot we really work hard to show and teach our students that they can. It might take a little longer to do something but with patience and time and instilling confidence, our writers can do anything that they set their minds to. The 
process for a horse coming in. We evaluate them typically for a 12 week period and we introduce them to the barn, to our ramp, to our sure hands lift. You know, our students, we have to think outside of the box to get our students on safely and the horses have to be very adaptive and accepting of those aids and they need to be quiet during quiet classes. Our students are typically walk, walk, trot riders. So horses that come from barns where they've been show ring, you know, fit, this might not be enough exercise to keep them behaving well in class. We're definitely not for everybody or for every horse. And the perfect candidate, we need tall, we need short, we need wide, and we need thin. My students come, we serve riders from seven on up. There's no age limit, so I need horses that can comfortably carry um, young children as well as adults. And they all have to be very willing to, to go to work. The horses that are figuring out how to avoid work don't do well in this program. You might have students riding that have no legs at all. They need to be willing to go forward with voice aids, with maybe a rider that's paralyzed on one side of his body and he has use of one hand and that rein aid as they're asking their horse to go right or go left might not be a very clear communication. And the horses, as they get to know their students and they learn what they're asking of them, they need to be willing partners in that relationship. It's a hard task to find the right ones, and the right ones are worth their weight in gold. <laughs> so how do our students find us? They find us through the web, and they find us by word of mouth. We get a lot of referrals from doctors and physicians, and so that word of mouth travel um, brings new students and that interest to the program. So there are a few things about this program that I feel sets us apart from other therapeutic writing programs in the industry. The, the fact that we're a curriculum-based program and what that means is that our students come and they are going to get a very well-rounded education. They're going to learn in addition to writing. We have driving and riding opportunities and our students are going to learn how to groom, how to tack, how to ride or drive. They're going to learn the parts of the equipment that they are using. They're going to learn how to retrieve their equipment, where it goes, how to maintain the leather so it stays in, in good condition and will last for years. They're going to learn safety on the ground. They're going to learn about breeds, colors, conformation. We're very much like a 4-H or a pony club. We are just here to serve riders that have physical disabilities. If someone is strictly looking for physical therapy or hippotherapy as it's referred to in this industry, we're not the right match. So if a doctor has recommended us to a parent. Maybe they have a child that has cerebral palsy and their gait is affected. Horseback riding is an excellent form of therapy to improve someone's gait and ambulation. But if that child is not interested in riding lessons, interested in being around the horses, in learning, then it just becomes something we're doing to them. And that's not really what we're trying to achieve here at Camelot. We want to work alongside our students, not do something to them. So it has to be um, a willing partnership from our students age seven and up. And we also are the only program that I know of that provides hour and a half long private instruction at no cost to our students or their families. We have been operating for, this is our 37th lesson season. We've never charged a penny for our services and we've been debt free since inception. So all of those things combined, we have a setting that is absolutely serene in our beautiful Sonoran Desert. Our students come, they have the opportunity to interact with the horses, engage with the volunteers. Right now, because of COVID, that socialization, that interaction is something that our community needs desperately. So we're trying to be creative and keep students safe, avoiding person-to-person -person contact, but still allowing that community, that connectivity, which is desperately needed. And all of those things combined tell me loud and clear that this program is beyond any other program out there. I'm a qualitative researcher, which means that my form of research means sort of meeting people in their sort of quote unquote natural settings, you know, and so I just spent endless countless hours for two years watching people and horses. And then out of that is where those in depth interviews emerged. Um, and, you know, and part of it was like, 
so interesting because you'd go to someone's house, to a woman's house to, to interview her, but maybe coming into the house, you'd pass all these photos of her horses. And before you even sat down for an interview, you might have been in her house for an hour or two, just listening to all the stories of different horses that have come and gone in her life and the meaning of them. And it was just such a rich process to really hear their stories and sort of watch them in motion with horses for two solid years. My findings in terms of human horse relationships was one that there was a clear communication system that humans and horses develop together in order to achieve some kind of goal. And that this communication system was made possible because horses themselves are individuals and have a subjective sense of the the world. And what I mean by subjective sense of the world is that they they are individuals who are making sense of the world. They are thinking, they are feeling, and they are decision-making creatures. And so often animals are thought of as purely instinctual, as not thinking, as not decision-making. And so part of the research project was one to sort of establish that they had a subjective sense of the world. And I could do that by all the participant observation that I, I engaged in, in watching people work with horses and then listening to the ways in which the women were describing their horses and the way in which they thought their horses made sense of the world. I mean, of course, we can't ever truly know what horses are thinking but we can sort of try to understand them as a species and their orientation to the world, and then try to sort of organize our understanding around them based on that information. And so in order for, in order for sort of human beings to connect to each other, there has to be something to connect to. Like, you know, humans have a self, you have a self, I have a self, and therefore we can connect. And I argued that horses too have a self. And that through that, their sort of subjective sense of the world and through sort of embodied communication, we can come to know each other. And in knowing each other, we could craft ways through communication to achieve all, all kinds of shared goals. And, or maybe I shouldn't say shared goals, but human-centered goals. And, and just you think about how remarkable horses are. I mean, all the 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 wide variety of things that horses as a species can do just is mind blowing to me. So you can teach horses to work in teams and pull wagons and pull agriculture equipment. And you can teach horses to be comfortable with you riding them and engage in all kinds of rhythmic movement and jumping with them. You can work with horses to round up cattle or sort cattle. You can teach horses to, you know, pack equipment. It's so amazing what horses can do. And in order to sort of do that with them in a way that was safe and humane, there had to be a basis of communication to make that possible. I'm originally from Illinois. I grew up with horses. I moved to Arizona about eight years ago now, and I got into photography. I was hiking. The scenery here is so much in my opinion, more beautiful than what it is in the Midwest. I love the mountains. And so I really got into photography and I was looking for an experience that was just not photographing just scenery. And I saw on LinkedIn that the USA Clydesdale Association was looking for a photographer. And I thought this was gonna be a, a great opportunity. I came out with and met with Rebecca. I think we sat outside and talked for maybe an hour or two <laughs> hours. Um, and I really fell in love with the organization and have been photographing all of their events and more recently um, came up with the idea to incorporate yoga because being out with the horses, whether I'm photographing them or volunteering, I just feel so relaxed and it's something that will help you. If you're having a bad day, I feel like I can just come out to this organization and you know, feel calm and it switches up my day, it switches up my routine and it's been very helpful. So adding in yoga to another element of the organization will be very helpful um, for lots of people, whether you're experienced with horses or not, I think it's going to 
bring a, a, a different type of audience to our organization and get the experience of what it's like to be around the Clydesdales. You don't have to be experienced with horses to come out. You don't have to be experienced with yoga. Um, the type of yoga that we'll be doing is gonna be for anyone and everyone. So I'm really excited to bring this to the organization. It would be something that anybody can come out to the organization and mm -hmm. practice and experience the horses all at the same time. So I um, found a program uh, through a friend of a friend and um, asked to started February, pre-COVID. It was all an online course and have spent probably, I mean, I've finished the certification in that beginning of May um, at this point, and I've spent hours. I've read so many books on different ways of modifying yoga and really incorporating this for people of all ages, whether you have um, physical disabilities, if you have arthritis, what different poses you can do. And I've spent a lot of time just researching and figuring out how we can make this work and then what we can do to incorporate the horses into our movement so that people can just get a sense of, of what it's like to be around the horses, as well as including breath work. I mean, you can just come out here, pet the horses and just do a couple breath work exercises and it would be an amazing experience. So I'm really excited to see how we grow I've been here for six years now and I don't see myself leaving at any point. We've grown, we've done so many different events. I've learned so much about the Clydesdales and I've really gotten to know each one of them. Um, I enjoy, I mean, we've been using Onita for the, for the yoga. She's, she's very calm. You can pet her. She will even give you hugs during yoga. So it's, it's a really fun experience. And I think that the people who have been able to come out and experience our classes have really enjoyed it. As human beings, part of our responsibility, if we are going to have horses in our lives, is also think about the impact of our relations with them. And I think it's easy as human beings to talk about how much horses offer us as humans. But I also think it's important to ask that question in return, like what can we offer to horses as humans? And how do we work diligently to really understand the equine species so that we care for them in a way that's best suited for them, that we are aware of not just their physical health, but their emotional well being, so that we ask questions around how, you know, wonder how our interactions with them might be affecting their emotional well being as much as their physical well-being and and also not sentimentalize horses too much. And by that I mean sort of sometimes I think they are such these spectacular beautiful creatures and you can get caught up in some kind of romantic vision of a horse. And I think also just really trying to understand horses as they are as a species and really asking deep questions and educating yourself on what they need. Because I think too often there are horses that are living in contexts that they're not, that are not well suited for the equine species. Or maybe we think that we're doing a lot of wonderful things for our horses because we love them and care for them, but maybe it may not be what's best for them. And so I think always just questioning sort of what, what is best for horses in this context what do they need as a species to thrive and be healthy and be well are always important questions to ask, especially as we're asking, you know, about what, what do horses offer us as humans? Medical expenses for large animals like the Clydesdales are not minimal. They are costly animals, so many people do not have the luxury of caring for horses in general, let alone a larger breed like the Clydesdale. Volunteers are always around the barn to lend a helping hand to help calm and ease the horse to make sure they are feeling a sense of comfort. Take your tape over. Yeah, you have the system. Okay. You're <laughs> Oh, 
You got it. You just have to. We have to get her comfortable enough to. Yeah, to just get her away. Yeah. Pull her down for it. She did very well. Thank you. Yeah. Nice job. Our foundation is now in the middle of the city. Before, we were in the middle of the country. And in Arizona, are able to have fireworks. The fireworks cause a lot of stress to the horses. On the holidays, when they can't have the fireworks, we spend all of our time till wee hours in the morning staying with the Clydesdales, spending time with them, trying to keep them calm and not having them stress out. About three years ago was the first time that we had to deal with fireworks and one of our horses after the July 4th incident came down with ulcers and it took us a year to get her back in shape from the ulcers. For some horses, fireworks are nothing but stress and for the Clydesdales it seems to be. Clydesdales are social and, like all horses, do best in a herd or a pack. The Clydesdales have a steady and calm disposition, making them reliable when pulling carriages and hauling carts. For this reason, many people treasure this breed as a trail horse or a close companion. When we took them to war, none of them did well. We were using gases back then. They were wearing gas masks, the horses were. I mean, war is not good for people, but to put the horses in there, and it wasn't strong need at the time of World War I and World War II, but they did not fare well at all. It was very difficult. And the draft horses, from what I understand, had the most amount of food eat a lot. I mean, they had to be fed good amount of rations, and it was hard to do. Every breed, I can't remember how many hundreds of thousands of horses were shipped over to Europe. They pulled all of the artillery wagons, they, they pulled all of the ambulances of the day, and provided a lot of other work for the soldiers. The Livestock Conservancy reports them at being about 5,000 worldwide, their population. That's not a lot. We sometimes compare it to the wonderful quarter horse that's 3 million worldwide. And so there's quite a discrepancy as to our popu you know, populations and not that we, are not, we do not need 3 million Clydesdales in this world. We do need more, but that's where we are on that on that spectrum. So it's, imp it's important that people know that so they know why we are trying to create more purposes for them. They, are, they make excellent police horses. They have worked for years in therapy as therapy horses with youth. So they have a lot of special gifts that they can give back to the public. So we are hoping that through our um, education that we do here that people are able to experience them more hands-on and to uh, witness what they are capable of and it is our turn for our generation to pick this up and for us to help this breed or they will be gone that we'll see them in books and that is it it is our time
We serve riders with a huge range of different physical disabilities. Students on our schedule might have cerebral palsy, multiple sclerosis, muscular dystrophy. They might have visual impairments. They might be hard of hearing or deaf. They might have genetic disorders. They might have Batten's disease. There's a whole slew of any sort of physical disability that might cause low tone. There might be disabilities that are an open head brain trauma, stroke survivors, someone could be paralyzed. We have riders with prosthetics, physical disability, anything under that umbrella are qualifiers for the program. Many of our students have cognitive impairments. They might have learning disabilities and that's absolutely fine. Everything can be modified so that the curriculum is still a wonderful um, roadmap to success for those riders, but they also have to have a physical disability. If they are struggling with psychological issues, depression, anxiety, ADD, ADHD, we're not quite the right program for them. We can only serve 24 students in a given season, so it's really important that all of those students fall under that umbrella of a physical disability so we don't sway from our original mission and operating orders. When I'm riding Barbara, she actually helps me to gather my muscles and stay straight because I'd say five years ago, I wasn't even able to sit on Barbara without leaning and pulling. And over the past five years, the input from being on the horse has helped me with my balance and being able to sit up straight. So the animal just gives me extreme pleasure to be connected to her. I mean, she knows me well after all these years and it's, it's just having a, a great bond with the animal. She trusts me and I trust her that she's going to take care of me. I'm elated. <laughs> I feel uh, she has helped with my confidence. She helped me to feel more confident. And uh, it just leaves me on a high. I guess I count a lot. I look forward to every Thursday. I was born with a uh, retinal eye disease. And over the years, it has progressed a lot more. And my husband had taken a job transfer to Arizona. And so I had no sense of community, no friends here, no family. And, sorry, this is emotional, actually. And I just was trying to find somewhere that I could go and find friends or people that accepted me and looked past my disability and gave me a purpose. Because as my disease progressed, I had given up my license, I gave up my corporate job. And so I kind of became a skeleton, a skeleton of who I used to be, and I kind of was lost on where to go. So I came across Camelot, and I just told my husband, you know, I found this place, can you take me here? And he brought me here, and Mary was just the sweetest person, and I just knew it was the right thing. And um, everyone here is just a true gem. They just have a heart of gold and they really do see past any type of a disability or a difference and that's very hard to find. And so I'm very lucky that I did find game a lot. When I come here, just the weight is lifted off my shoulders because at home or just when I'm in you know, an everyday environment, I have so many things that I think about, all the stresses of how am I going to do this, where's the restroom, how am I going to find the restroom. Um, just all the different things that I stress about kind of just go out the, out the window and I can come here and feel like how I used to feel when I had more independence and kind of be a little bit more of the person that I used to be and just, you know, be more independent is the biggest thing. When I'm with the horses, it's just a sense of no judgment, unconditional love. They're just so content and they bring your mood up. They just make you feel like a peace almost when you're around them. and especially when you're on horseback with them. For me, it's just like a sense of freedom and they're a part of the ride with you, so you don't feel alone. And it's just a bond, like a bond that you get, you get with them. One of the things I found in the research is that all the women I interviewed and even beyond sort of just the people I talked to doing my observations during those two years, 
many of them talked about having a sense of their embodiment that they likely felt they would not have had if they didn't work with horses. And so they had an understanding of their bodies as communicative, as a place where they could make sense of the world. Because, you know, in Western culture, we, pr we give primacy to the mind that, you know, knowledge comes from the mind. Knowledge is how we make sense of the world. And a lot of the people were saying that their bodies themselves became this place where they could produce knowledge and make sense of the world. And that it gave them this empowered sense of their embodiment and this sense of their bodies as intelligent. And I think that that's, that might speak to one of the reasons why um, equine assisted therapy or working um, horses and humans working together when humans have physical disabilities, that horses offer to humans an alternate sense of their embodiment that you can't get in everyday life. There's n nothing I feel like you can get in everyday life that when you are on the back of a horse, like the sense of your embodiment that you are able to achieve on the back of a horse is so different than anything else you could experience, I think, by yourself, you know, or anything else you could experience with another human because all of a sudden you're joining your body literally. I mean, you are body to body. I mean, there might be a saddle or a pad between you, but literally you're body to body. And this horse's body now becomes an extension of your body. And you can run so much faster than you ever could alone. You could jump so much higher than you ever could alone. You could do all kinds of movements in ways that you never could on your own. And so horses offer to humans this alternate sense of embodiment that I think is quite empowering. There's a way in which I don't quite have the words for it because it is such an embodied experience. It's almost beyond language, if you will. We don't have the words yet to describe that kind of embodied experience. And so I don't think we've understood well enough sort of what that is that horses can offer humans in terms of this alternate experience of being an embodied person in the world. One last step. Whether it is the Clydesdale or any other breed of horse, there's something special to be found in their existence. These animals are truly making an impact on humans in many different ways. The human-horse connection is something to be grateful for and appreciate from years past and cherished for the years to come.